Welcome everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I am really excited to see you. And when I bring on today's guest, we are going to be talking today about contact with non-humans, the whys and the wherefores about it. So guys, I am Joan of Angels. <clears throat> I am one of the co-producers, by the way, at Portal to Ascension, and I helped Neil uh, produce several events, and we'll talk about a few of them in a minute. And I am also here to help you remember who you are and why you're here. That's why I'm called Joan of Angels. And I help you access your special gifts and your superpowers, the tools that you were given when you came here. So you can check that out at joanofangels.com. And if you're new to the channels, by the way, please like, subscribe, and share both Portal to Ascension and Joan of Angels. We appreciate that. All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the upcoming shows that are happening. And Tina, if you could show that, we'd appreciate it. So upcoming in April, first of all, you can see it's the first one is the Pyramid Conference coming up first weekend of, of spring and going down, we can continue down to, gosh, it's a little tiny when you look at it this way, the uh, science and, gosh, it is, it's, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Psychology, science, and evidence behind near-death experiences. I thought that's what it was, a very fascinating event. Neil has many experts on that. Then we're going to do a deep dive into the Pleiadians the ancient present, okay, past and future connections that they've had with Earth. So that's moving into Sunday, April 10th. So be sure to register for that. And then, really exciting, we have Marina Surin. She's going to be talking about making contact with extraterrestrials workshop. So if you have wanted to make contact, register for that one. And then we have a really good conference coming up. They're all good, but this is a three-day free online conference, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Some of your favorite speakers are going to be on that. So register for that. It is free or by donation. And then on Monday, after that, you might as well click on register now, Tina, for that, how to use the intuitive gifts you were born with. So Neil and I have been talking a lot about intuition how we can help people really get through these times. And this class is going to be about helping you remember how to use the, the intuition, how to use your clairsentience, your clairvoyance, your clairaudience, so that you can actually hear the voice of your intuition and learn to trust your gut. So that's going to be on Monday, April 18th. So please, please sign up for that now. All right. Thank you so much, Tina. So I'm happy to introduce all of that to you so you can join us at Portal to Ascension. And now I want to tell you a little bit about our guest today. You've probably all heard of her, okay? Uh, Kathleen Martin. We're going to be discussing all things extraterrestrial. But actually, before I even share the introduction about her, I want to kind of give us all a reminder. Avon, many of you have met him. He's my tall white extraterrestrial Zeta that I actually found in 2012 at the very first live Portal to Ascension conference. So in honor of that, I always bring Yvonne on to our UFO shows. All right. So now everyone just take a deep breath. <clears throat> Good. And then let it all out. And then let's just take another centering deep breath in. And let it all out. And let's just ask that the information that comes through today be for the highest good of all concerned, that it could be information that is very timely for you, that helps to open up areas of receptivity for you, helps you give, give you information that will help you on your journey of life. All right. And that being said, thank you for being here. So Kathleen Martin is an author, an on-camera expert, consultant, international conference presenter, experiencer advocate, intergenerational experiencer, and hypnosis practitioner. So since the 90s, she has researched the perplexing nature of UFOs and the non-human entities associated with highly advanced aerial 
vehicles via her own groundbreaking research and investigations. And she's also actually the 2021 recipient of the International UFO Conference Lifetime Achievement Award. So for 30 years, she has engaged in scientifically focused research on ET experiencers, the history of government involvement in major UFO studies, and U.S. government's obfuscation of the facts. In other words, calling everyone conspiracy theorists, not diving into it. So during this time, she was closely associated with the Mutual UFO Network. She as the director of the Experiencer Research Team and the Edgar, Casey, Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Ordinary Extraordinary Encounters as both the research consultant and advisory board member. And the last thing I'm really going to tell you about it is her interest in UFOs and contact began in 1961 when her aunt and uncle, the renowned Betty and Barney Hill, had a close encounter and subsequent abduction in New Hampshire's White Mountains. And so since then, she has conducted extensive multi-year investigation into their experiences and her several books and the 60th anniversary edition of Captured are available for purchase. So we'll look at her website in a bit. Kathleen, it is just such an honor to have you here. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you too, Joan. Well, it really is. I think I was, you know, I, I'm an angel experiencer and also mm -hmm. an extraterrestrial experiencer. And um, so I try to combine them both. Not hard to do. A great idea. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. So, God, you you know, you have such an extensive history. And I'm wondering, like, how old were you when you first, like, the, you know, Betty, there that was your aunt and uncle, right? Mm -hmm. So how old were you when you first found out about their experiences? Well, I found out about their experience when I was 13 years old. I had just gotten off the school bus after school, walked into the house, and my mother was on the telephone with my Aunt Betty and uh, having a very unusual conversation about the close encounter they had had with a flying saucer the night before and how they were afraid that they might have been contaminated because the craft came so close to them. It was only about 100 feet away from my uncle as he was standing in a field. Okay, so I don't know. I feel like I'm hearing this for the first time. In other words, this was like you came home from school the day after it happened. Yes. Okay, so that, that's a different kind of energy. It wasn't even something that you heard about. So you, did you have, like, what was your response to that? I <clears throat> had learned in school that um, none of the planets in our solar system were inhabited. So I thought, oh, this is different. And so I started talking to my mother about the solar system and became very interested in that and getting a telescope and that sort of thing. And, you know, I was a really curious kid. I wanted to learn all that I possibly could about this. Within two days, we went to Betty's and Barney's house. And I was able to hear the story from Betty's own mouth and uh, to observe the watches that no longer worked, that were working the night that they uh, were taken to craft, because uh, they didn't know at that time that they had been taken to craft. But um, also uh, the shiny spots on the trunk of the car that hadn't been there on the night of their trip home but were there when they arrived home and they uh, had a magnetic field around them. Uh, a compass that was placed over those spots would spin and spin. When it was moved away, the needle would drop down. So there was physical evidence. The tops of Barney's shoes were so deeply scraped that he had to buy new shoes. Betty's dress was torn in several places. And there were so many questions. Uh, and so, you know, being a very curious kid, my favorite author was the, you know, the Nancy Drew series. <laughs> oh, mine too. Mine too. Absolutely. I wanted to be Nancy Drew. If I could just solve mysteries, I'd be, I'd be in my element. So there you were solving. So to you, it was really a mystery. You put yes. on your little investigative hat 
and it was happening to your aunt and uncle. And mm -hmm. it, I'm guessing that it rang true to you then. Like, well, yes, absolutely. I had no because you saw the evidence. And this was before people, I think they were what some of the first abduction experiencers. So it wasn't as if people had been talking about this before. Right. They were the first scientifically investigated case of alien abduction is what they called it in those days. Interesting. I bet some of it happened because they knew that the researcher in you was going to take over and take this <laughs> even public. Because as I was reading your story, I was thinking about, well, is this generational with extraterrestrial abductions? Do they take families of people? And and I can, I can imagine they can see into the future. So it's not so far-fetched that it was like, well, this is story is going to go worldwide because we're going to bring her niece into it. <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe they're behind this. But, um, you know, our studies show that 60% of the experiencers uh, have knowledge that other family members have been taken as well. So, you know, the, it's probably higher than that. But a lot of families simply don't discuss it. 60%. So did your family discuss it? Not really. I mean, it was when, when I was 17, my mother and I had memories of being taken to craft. When ah, okay. a UFO landed in, on my grandparents' farm, 160 feet from my childhood home. And my mother and I recalled being on craft. There were two people who observed that craft. And so my mother and I uh, discussed it later, but not immediately after it happened, because the way my 17-year-old mind uh, put this all together was that, well, I must have needed surgery. So my mother must have uh, had a surgical team go into my bedroom in the middle of the night and so uh, set up a table and I was on the table undergoing surgery in the middle of the night so I wouldn't be frightened. She wouldn't take me to the hospital for it. I mean, it was completely naive and crazy. I mean, it's even crazier than the idea that I was actually taken to craft. And that was the cover memory. I always saw those entities around me, but I couldn't see their faces for a long time. And then finally, in a huge reaction, emotional release, I remembered what they looked like. And they well, so how in. old are you? How old are you at this period of time? In that period of time? Mm-hmm. I was 17. Okay. Mm-hmm. So your memories don't go back before Betty and Barney's experience? Only under it, hypnosis. Under okay, hypnosis, so. I was three, and I remembered very clearly what I was doing the ET standing in the doorway on this little round room in the craft, and a girl who was older than me, probably by three or four years, maybe long, oh, mm, yeah, maybe more, five years. And she looked exactly like me, only older. And so that is a curious memory as well. <laughs> especially for a three-year-old to have these memories. So your family ha was kind of a contact, well, an abductee family at that point. Why do you think that they kind of took your family? Well, what they told me was that uh, initially they uh, picked up a lot of kids on the back lands of farms and, and adults too. And various uh, areas when they were camping or hunting or fishing or whatever. And then they were able to select the family groups who had the characteristics that they wanted. And they told me when I was on the table, when they took me, that they had to take tissue samples because they were concerned about environmental toxins. And so they had wanted to check the level of toxicity in my body. Now, it wasn't until later that I was able to comprehend what that meant. I grew up uh, probably a half mile downhill 
from a soup, what ended up being a Superfund site. And I was 20 miles away from a nuclear base. Okay, so what they, they were protecting you. They were looking yeah. to see, to heal you. They were. And, they and were protect protecting you from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so your 17 year old self kind of picked that up, even though you didn't exactly understand why. Right. That's, that's the information they gave me. Mm -hmm. And I and always did they... wondered why. What was, was I eating something that was toxic or what? I didn't know that that barrel factory would become a super fun site, that it was polluting the lake and the stream and the wells. <laughs> right. But nevertheless, they chose to pick, to come and get you and help heal you. And did they ever give you an indication of why they might choose you to do this? Or did you have any feeling like maybe you were compelled to, to, because to, obviously you've been compelled in some way, <laughs> shape or form to yeah. bring this out. But I'm thinking, did you have a, a sense of why you were being compelled or what they might want humanity to know through you or things like that? Well, I can tell you that when I was on craft, they projected the most profound sense of love that I had ever felt. Nothing like I'd ever felt on this planet unless they were nearby. And uh, they, they told me that I was family as well, that they loved me and that I had a job to do. And that that job was to be a communicator between them and humanity. So um, that's what I've been doing. But for many, many years, I would not admit that I've had these experiences myself because of the ridicule factor. And so I was just a researcher and uh, I did the, I worked on three major studies on about 5,000 experiencers. And um, we had open-ended questions as well as true and false or fill in whatever. And I discovered that others uh, were given the same messages that I was given. So then I would talk about them, but not personally. Um, so that's what I did from years ago. I don't care. Uh, people who ridicule are simply ignorant. So that's a big, if you came in through with your science, you know, like, like, objective. I never approached UFOs from an objective point of view. I've always had a relationship intimate point of view. But I can imagine coming from that other point of view might have been a little more difficult. Well, from the scientific objective, uh, it, well, you have to be very, very careful you have in, in your work. And, and, and I think that that was extraordinarily important to, to look at all of the scientifically, to look for evidence, and to do all of the work that I did over my lifetime. But uh, I've done uh, the work that not only I, but the people that I've worked with have done uh, is extraordinary. It gives a tremendous amount of evidence that uh, we didn't have previously. It's not anecdotal evidence. It is uh, scientific evidence. And so that's really important. We had PhD scientists, social scientists working on these studies. And But now I just feel like I can... I've reached the age where I can sit back and relax and enjoy what I'm doing to take some of that pressure off myself and, and just live uh, the life that I want to live. Very, very interesting, and which you're, of course, being guided to do. But, you know, I know that there's been a, a dichotomy between the science, the researchers, you know, the very specific, detailed that you can prove. Mm -hmm. And then there's the experiencers and the channelers who've had, like with Betty or or now even yourself, it's, it's almost sometimes felt like to me like we, they were speaking two different languages. Yes, in fact, I have to tell you, I was a nuts and bolts researcher from the time I started 
my own investigations in about 1990 until about 2011. And then in 2011, when we did our first study on experiencers, I realized that uh, the nuts and bolts science uh, acceptance of of what all of this was was dishonest because it wouldn't accept the interdimensional part of it. The light orbs that are present in over 60% of experiencers' homes, those conscious orbs that sometimes pop into uh, non-humans, they're just, they're just uh, sort of at the membrane between dimensions. They mm-hmm. say that they see us as orbs too until we're in the same dimension. So, uh, you know, that was something that I, I knew and I was not going to ignore any longer. The feeling that something unseen is walking on the bed. Over 75% said that, that uh, they had memories of this, and conscious recall of this happening in their homes. And I was not going to ignore it and say they are just imagining it. And right. that's when my work really took off, when when I moved beyond the nuts and bolts. Do you do, so, so I read now you do regressions for people, right, also? Yes. So then you would, t- you've also then had stories from many of your clients, I'm guessing, who've had these experiences as well. Yes, yes, from, from clients I uh, studied under Dolores Cannon. So mm-hmm. I did a quantum healing hypnosis technique, and I was also studied uh, and was, was certified years before that uh, as a hypnotherapist when I lived in New Hampshire. So then um, as you were doing that kind of work, then you're coming to terms with your science investigation research, Right. And now you're now you're telling the truth about what you've seen. Being an experiencer versus a scientific investigator. So I, I'm a chiropractor. I should be I should be upfront. I'm a chiropractor, oh, uh-huh. and so my whole life's training. But I I really had to deal with the medical doctor opinion about chiropractic, and so mm-hmm. I just went specifically very much with with you know what you call people's experiences. Mm-hmm. Okay, so rather than defending the science of chiropractic against the science of Western medicine, I defended the experiences that people had of getting better. Because mm-hmm. honestly, you can't take that away by your science. So I've been an experiencer inside and out, I suppose is my point. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so now that we know you've been an experience and I really think it's exciting to see some of what you were saying, you and I, before we got on, we were talking about ways then that the experiences can be proven through research. And you were sharing with me a little bit about how the investigation into the Council of Eight that you were part of. Maybe you could share a little bit about that investigation with us. Yes. Well, in 2016, uh, I was introduced to a man named Kevin Briggs, and uh, he had been having experiences with ETs since he was a boy in England. Uh, he grew up, he became a police officer, his, and he got married to a woman who was a professor at a university. And then they moved to the United States uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, he came to me he, for hypnosis. And so uh, during this hypnosis session, he had been a, pa- a paper boy back in England. He, he had missing time after he saw a landed craft. And so he remembered being taken to craft and he uh, met the Council of Eight on the craft. So the Council of Eight is uh, eight beings, seven of them are fifth and sixth dimensional entities. There are two tall human types, one blue avian, one tall white, a mantis type, uh, about a five foot tall gray and another gray who is taller than that. And then 
there is a ninth dimensional who is uh, oversees the council. It's called the Council of Eight because he's one of the members, but he, he hasn't had a physical body for thousands of years, he says. So um, this was interesting. I uh, had always kind of scoffed at channeling over the years. People had come to me with their channeled messages and uh, there wasn't any consistency except for in one, and that was with Paul Hamden from Australia, uh, who had sent ETs to heal me in 2012. So and did Kelly, they? Yes, did they, they did. heal you? Yes. Okay, well, I'll ask you about that in a minute. You then. can ask about that. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, Kevin invited. Uh, a team of researchers and investigators to go to his house once a month. We met for a period of two years and we got to meet the council of eight members and we took our equipment to uh, measure their heat energy, of other things, the equipment we took. And I recorded and transcribed all of the meetings. So um, we were able to, when the fifth and sixth dimensionals came into the room, we had a laser thermometer and we were able to measure about a five degree temperature increase where they were standing. When the ninth dimensional came in, it jumped up to about eight degrees. So that was an, an incredible increase and Kevin, was soaking wet when the session ended. His, his clothing was wet. There was perspiration dripping off his face. And he was very tired at the beginning of this. He'd never channeled before. So this was a first for him too. This, the, but the Council of Eights had come to him over the years, giving him telepathic messages. And they wanted him to meet with us. So we met and uh, we were able to ask questions. We each were able to bring a couple of questions to the meetings and ask them and receive very specific answers from the Council of Eight. Aside from that, what they wanted to do is to prove their existence to us. So they selected each of us and they told us when they would show their craft and communicate with us individually. And they did that. And the, the first time Zark came to me, the, and they have names, Zark is a, a five foot tall gray scientist. Uh -huh. So I, they arranged for uh, me to meet him but he jumped the gun and, and my husband and I were driving to uh, see my grandson perform at Disney Springs. I live in Florida and Zark entered the, the truck we were driving in and started to communicate with me. I could feel this very strong electrical tingling sensation through my entire body. I grabbed a piece of started furiously writing what he was telling me and telepathically communicating with him, asking questions. And it's a good thing I did because when he left, I had absolutely no memory of what was said. I think so your husband didn't see him, right? No. Okay. And you, but you heard him and you actually started writing it. Was this your first channeled experience? Like that you channeled? Um, Yes. Wow. Yes, it was. You know, and it's so, not the first telepathic communication that I'd had with ETs, but it's the first one I think that I had off craft. And the first, you might say channeling, I called it telepathic communication. And um, so then he was supposed to meet with me and, and show me a craft. And I said, okay, I live on a lake. I want you to come at five o'clock in the morning, my time, and and uh, show me a craft up close over the lake. So the day came, and oh I was out sitting on my deck, looking out at the lake, 
and I suddenly feel this very strong tingling sensation all over again. I know he's there. And I then I see about a 35 to 40 foot circle of turbulence on the lake. And I'm, I was thinking to myself, is there a craft under the water that's going to rise up? No, it didn't. So is this an invisible craft over the water creating the turbulence? Well, I asked about that. And, and what I was told is that uh, it was probably just Zark's energy that was doing that. So oh, <laughs> that's what he, he said. So, that so have you some... seen him? Have you actually been able to sort of visualize him in your inner eye or like, you know well, what he feels like? I know what he feels like. I know what he looks like because I have seen him in a dream just before I woke up in the morning when you have those hypnopompic right. dreams that uh, just seem too real to, to have been dreams. And right. yeah, I saw him in one of those dreams and and Kevin confirmed that that is what he what his appearance is like so once you got connected with the the channel the group of 8 the council of 8 and you were in these investigations now you're also channeling at least one of them yes i could uh I, I was supposed that. to channel at one of these meetings, but I was uh, there were new people that had come into the group. And I was just too nervous. I knew that two of them were skeptics. And so I couldn't channel. So Kevin ended up doing it. But that later that day, I had uh, two women who were staying at my house because they came from a distance away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I channeled in front of them that night. You know, that's interesting. I channel and I know that there's times I'm too embarrassed. If, if I'm with certain people, I can't. I just can't. Or if I think they're better. So I've had that issue also. So now, now the investigator channeler <laughs> that you are, I'm finding this so fascinating. I am enjoying this. Amazing. Okay. So let's see what we have here. You see with the third eye, she saw the blue beings. They were in the etheric, but I saw them like a dim light compared to the light we see in 3D. So this is a, an interesting experience. Have you seen them since then? Do you now continue, Kathleen, to kind of have these dreams or experience them? Well, I meditate. And mm -hmm. I had difficulty until I was able to move over into my right brain. When I was at mm -hmm. that left brain scientist, nothing was working for me. But as I moved to the right brain through group guided meditation, uh, I uh, developed that ability. And now I can, I can see and communicate with entities uh, if my meditation is successful. And uh, sometimes someone just comes into my office or wherever I am, I feel that very strong tingling sensation through my entire body and might uh, communicate with me telepathically. But um, it, it doesn't happen that often, but I always, it seems, have something going on with my crown chakra where I feel tingling sensations in the crown chakra quite often, especially when the information that's being given is accurate or they agree with it. So I have to say something. I never expected this conversation to go in this direction. And I am totally loving what I'm hearing. Everyone needs to go out and get this book of yours because I know you reveal this in your book. You do yeah. talk about it and you talk about the Council of Eight. So I'm guessing then that the the your research proved that these interdimensional or extraterrestrial beings existed. Yes. And absolutely. proved it in your mind. Yes, we had scientific evidence in the term in terms of uh, their presence, of what we observed when they were going to show us craft or communicate with us, and also with the the temperature increase in the section of the room where they were, and uh, also they showed me orbs, 
when we'd ask for something, they would show us. So uh, we were very happy about that. And they told us that they would not show themselves in the physical until we had actually raised our vibration uh, high enough. And they said, when it's raised high enough, you'll be able to see us. And so I'm still waiting for that. I haven't seen them yet, except for one ninth dimensional who looked like a translucent angel. So I, I, I totally understand because my experience with the angelic realms is that they have said that as we raise, for us to see them, we need to raise our, vib our vibration so we can match up to them. And that even though they can come down to us, if we see them, but I want you to know that I have actually seen an ET with my physical eye, mm -hmm. but I was in, you know, a plant medicine state. And so I have also heard from other people in that state that they have seen, and I was very surprised. It was mm -hmm. a tall white in my backyard. I guess it was family of my friend, Avon. And mm -hmm. They commune. It was two ETs. One of them, I couldn't tell what they were. The other looked like a boxy white cereal package. Like, mm -hmm. um, if you know what I mean, the head was sort of square rectangular box. And I asked, well, how did you get here? And the communication I got was by a saucer taxi from 29. They, they lived under near 29 Palms. There's a big base up there, military base. And they said there was an mm -hmm. underground base. They lived back there and they took like some kind of saucer ship taxi. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting. So we have some interesting questions. The one before this was, have you been on the ship? And actually, we'd love for you to describe the ship. And then the second question is, well, have how did you cope with it? Did you feel fear? Um, and this person is actually feeling terror sometimes. So if we can address that one, too. This is exciting. Everyone's, yeah. we're all excited to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I used to feel terror. Um, I, I walked with trepidation at night. I thought that I was being put on a table and treated like a lab rat. And, and that's because uh, the early researchers were telling all of us that that's what was happening to us, even though I had no memory of that. Uh, that is what we were being told by the experts. Um, and and I was terrified. I, I didn't want it to happen. I thought I was being exploited. And uh, over time, I realized that that simply was not true because I had hypnosis. I had conscious recall for a lot of years. And uh, when they would come into my room, I would have a fight or flight response. I, I'd be awake a lot of times. And then, you know, everything after that was so terrifying. They, they look different. They feel different. They, I was afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And, what and I understand completely. But after years of doing my own research and investigation, of all of this and having hypnosis uh, where I was not led to uh, feeling this love that was coming from them, for this concern about our planet, about nuclear weapons, about me and any toxins that might have been absorbed into my own body. After I was healed by them, and I found out that many, many others, 45% of the abductee group in one of our studies of 516 experiencers in all, the abductee, 45% of the abductees said they had asked for healing and received it. Um, you know, that they're not being exploited. In Free's study, the Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation study on uh, close to 5,000 experiencers now, and I worked on the early parts of that, um, we discovered that 83% would not end their experiences today if they were given that choice. Uh, on MUFON's study lot. that I just mentioned, it was 71% of the experiencers overall who wouldn't end it. And on uh, the abductee group 
it was 74% who would not end it. And, you know, MUFON is kind of a, a, an investigative group where people might be frightened, might have think they're having bad experiences a lot, have never had hypnosis, that sort of thing. When people go there, uh, you know, you think that they're going to say, no, I want to stop this. But I was really surprised to find out that they don't want it to end and that well, they're growing older and they're receiving messages and understanding more they're being healed so that's a so very the, good yeah so the the frightening aspects of being an abductee for the reasons you thought you were being taken turned out to not be the reasons but only because we couldn't communicate about it mm -hmm. and Perfect. so in a it's, it's really fascinating so and so not only would they not want to stop it, but I'm guessing they also feel they've benefited from this experience. Like I understand, I feel like some of my intuitive gifts, my gifts of seeing and sight have been especially more pronounced because of my contact with extraterrestrials. I'm, I'm positive of it because I don't think I had as deep gifts as I had years ago. And I read somewhere that, that, people who've had contact with extraterrestrials have more telepathic skills. Yes. Yes. We, we communicate telepathically on craft. They say that telepathy is the universal language. Do you remember being on craft? Like, do you have visions of what it looked like on the craft? Could you share yes, a few I, of those? Yes. I remember um, being in a, a kind of a wide corridor. And, and I've been on two different crafts. One of them, I, I guess, is um, a disc-shaped craft, um, oval or circular. And um, inside the craft, everything was just really uh, clean, not a lot of uh, equipment no that I could see or anything like that. Um, one time I was in some kind of uh, thick gel-like substance. And it seemed like I was in like a drawer and they pulled me out. I, they had, had to take me someplace where I needed protection. And so they took me out of that and um, took me to that front part of the craft. Um, I also uh, have been into like small rooms on the craft where they perform certain procedures on me. And there would be generally two down by my feet and at least one or two up by my head. And there was one entity that always accompanied me. He was my escort and would give me information and that sort of thing. So that would be, you know, when I'd be on a table having some kind of a physical procedure or they uh, would make me feel like I was tingling very strongly and saying that they were trying to raise my vibrational frequency. I love this. We're speaking the same language. What? Why are you call? Why do you refer to them as entities? Is there a particular reason for that term for you? Well, I don't want to call them extraterrestrials because I'm not certain that they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe some are extraterrestrials and some are interdimensional. So they seem to be interdimensional anyway, regardless of mm -hmm. where they're coming from. But in my book. Um, forbidden knowledge. I wrote about information I'd received from the granddaughter of uh, Navy Rear Admiral Herbert Knowles, who had known my aunt and uncle Betty and Barney Hill. He lived in Maine. And uh, I had been attempting to acquire more information about Admiral Knowles and had spoken about this publicly. I was looking for a family member during my research for the book Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, uh, I was not able to locate any of that family. And finally, Admiral Knowles' granddaughter 
came into a conference where I was speaking and handed me a thick packet of information. And in there uh, were letters between Wilbert Smith, the, the Canadian, brilliant Canadian scientist who was their UFO guy, and Admiral Knowles. And what I was able to discover is that they were attempting to find scientific verification for information that was given to a woman in Maine um, named Frances Swan. And the government was involved in this. Uh, the information that Admiral Knowles received was so scientifically credible and way beyond the level of education or knowledge that Francis Swan had, that, that he ended up giving that packet and a letter to Margaret Chase Smith, who was the uh, U.S. Senator from Maine. And then that went to Dwight Eisenhower in 1954. And then uh, the top brass from Washington ended up going up to the Knowles home to study Francis Swan. And then this study continued secretly. So that information wasn't anywhere uh, until it was handed to me by Admiral Knowles' granddaughter. And she told me that his phone was tapped. The family all knew that and, and uh, gave me permission, actually asked me to talk about this. Um, and I kept it secret for years because it was taboo. But as I've moved on in my knowledge, I decided to release it. And uh, it's incredible. The information given by the ETs in 1954 about wanting to help uh, our planet and our people, their concerns as they are now were nuclear, um, nuclear proliferation, nuclear detonation of weapons. They said, and this is why I wonder if they're interdimensionals, that when we detonate a thermonuclear weapon, that tears into the membranes between the dimensions and causes destruction into other dimensions. Also, um, and the information they gave was about how we needed to care for our environment. We ignored it and see where we are now. And uh, they offered to teach us to give us their technology, but we had to all agree to share and share equally and work together as nations. Each of us would have a little piece of the puzzle and our governments refused. Right. So that's what happened in 1954, but that was the thing that spurred me on to continue with this line of research. And now, to since I speak to people all over the world, to give everyone this information to try to save our planet. Where, you know, I think we're in a, a critical point. And for years, experiencers have been telling me that they feel like they have some kind of knowledge locked up inside. And now they feel that we're on the precipice and something big is going to happen. They don't know what but they know that they have an important role in this. And so I'm just sharing the knowledge that I've been able to acquire. And in Forbidden Knowledge, you'll read 120 of our questions and answers from the council, very specific answers. I, I think it's really fascinating. I started, I did a deep dive into the book already and I'm just not, I'm fascinated not by the book, but by you so much is like, wow, that you managed to get past your, that, that logical, rational, scientific mind to open up to the channeling aspect of it. And now, of course, your research is probably exponential off the chart. This is probably exactly what they wanted from you to open mm -hmm. up to this side. And, and this is invaluable for us. And I think you are a role model for that other aspect of the MUFON investigators who are purely the science. I, I think people are called to research the extraterrestrial questions, whether they know it or not, and whether they get to the point you have or not, they've still been called 
to do this. It's very, I think it's very special. I do too. I think it's extraordinarily important. And um, I was MUFON's director of experience or research for uh, 10 years. And I stepped down about a year ago um, to pursue this and the spiritual part of it uh, more thoroughly. And so I'm, I am still a consultant, but I'm, I'm really taking a deep dive into this fascinating part of it. I, I just, this is really delightful for me. So guys, if you have any other last minute questions, we did have someone ask if either of us have had any NDEs, you know, near death experiences. I haven't per se, but I've had my own contact with, with an angelic beings and ETs. But so have you had an NDE? That was the question. Uh, I don't know if it was an NDE or not, but I was uh, extraordinarily ill back in 2014. And um, I should have gone to the doctor sooner, but it was over the holidays. It was just uh, finally my mother came to me. My deceased mother came to me in one of those dreams just before I woke up in the morning. Mm -hmm. It seemed real, too real to have been a dream. And of course. she said, I'm not going to take you with me today, but I might be back in a few days to take you with me. And then I thought, ooh, I guess I'd better go to the hospital. So I had my husband take me in. And oh, my God. Yes, my, my blood at that point, I was so dehydrated from this uh, stomach flu that uh, my blood, they said, was like crankcase oil. Do you do you think you've had like a walk-in experience that that the side of you that's been channeling and telepathic communication now and and you know precognitive dreaming do you think maybe you're more of a walk-in now is there a part of you that's different than what you were before well it's that tingling that i have um i don't know if it's a walk-in if there's somebody there or, or what it is, I know when I do QHHT hypnosis and the healing part of it, something is channeling down through me. I hold my arms out over a person. They might be two feet above the person. That tingling sensation is moving down through my hands and they feel heat below and, and they're healed. So, I mean, some, there's something new there. There's something going on with there me. There is and something new. Good. Something very new with you because and, and my experience of you is really taking a huge, like, oh, my God, there's so much to connect with about you that you've opened up some something that wasn't there before. You Absolutely. were always fascinating, interesting, you know, brilliant. And now there's even a new element that's come in. Why don't you, and I, I take that as a compliment. I mean, yes, it's just absolutely. exciting because I'm, a, you. you know, I, I talk to angels. So mm -hmm. I'm coming from that perspective as opposed to the Dr. Joan who aced her biology and microbiology. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, that one isn't talking. So, all right. Tell everyone how they, what you're doing now, how they can find you and upcoming events. My upcoming events are on my website. You can purchase autographed copies of my books there. You can book a, a consultation. I keep the price very low because a lot of people can't afford it. So I just talk to, to people about whatever they want to talk about. Uh, a lot of experiencers come to me and, and just want a little support. Um, so I'm going to be speaking uh, in Pennsylvania at the Butler Paranormal Conference in April, uh, in May, out in McMinnville, Oregon, in uh, July, the 1st of July, over the fourth weekend of the 4th in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, a week later at the MUFON uh, International Symposium in uh, Denver, and then in September, there were two, one in Exeter, New Hampshire, and one in uh, Michigan. And the clickable links to find out more information about all of those are on my website, 
along with some free articles that you can read uh, as well. So uh, it's all there, kathleen-martin.com. You can see it right there on the screen. And uh, so that's <laughs> that's my story. Wow. Quite a story, Kathleen. Really exciting to do a deep dive with you. I've just been so fascinated. And Thank I appreciate you so. you so much. I appreciate all. I appreciate that 13 year old girl who's like on the phone, like hearing your aunt was just taken something weird. Because in those days, all I saw pictures of were the National Enquirer showed like UF ETs is like these little it was big eyes and stuff. So I can just imagine like what that would have been like at 13 to hear. And then now you're channeling them, you're bringing all aspects of the subject to light. So yes. well done. Thank well you. Done. And I just so much appreciate this gift that's been given to me. It's uh, It makes me feel happier than I've ever felt in my life. I can feel it, okay? I feel it all the way over here. It has been just wonderful. Thank you so much. I know that all of our followers are just going to be really happy with this interview. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And maybe one day I'll see you on the ships. Well, maybe we will. <laughs> Wouldn't that right? Be? <laughs> that would be so fun, guys, if we all said, okay, Kathleen, we'll see you tonight on the ships and we'll we'll continue our interview. All right. Thank you so much, love. Ciao. And thank you. Guys, okay. I am so fascinated, but I could feel her joy. And I mean, I have actually met Kathleen years ago and I could just feel that how her life has changed with, with just connecting now and this deep dive that she's been doing. So what a great interview. All right, guys. So thank you so much for being with us. Do not forget, I have my upcoming event. Maybe Tina will show it again. Coming up, how to use your intuitive gifts that you were born with. And that does include telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, how to learn to trust your gut every time so we can all you know, really thrive during these days. So that's on Portal to Ascension. I hope to see you all there. And meanwhile, please like, subscribe, and share. So we love you all so much. Thank you for being with us. And again, I'll see you all next time. Have a great, beautiful, fantastic day. Bye for now.